Hello and welcome back to another episode of Political Agenda with me, PJ Thumb. I am wearing a green and pink uh, batik shirt, sitting in front of a map of Southeast Asia with two other men, and my pronouns are he, him. And joining me once again today, my co-host, Sean Francis Han, Editor-in-Chief of Wake Up Singapore. How are you doing, Sean? I'm good, good. Really excited to get into this one, critical theory, you know, um, critical humanities. This is like right up my alley, right? So anyway, I am wearing a yet another green basic. That's all I have in my closets and black jeans. And my pronouns are he, him. Why are yeah. you guys talking about like the stuff you wear? I mean, come on, like PJ Tom is wearing, I mean, this nice uh, shirt, but he's wearing, pe- uh, he's wearing shorts actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's just jump straight into it. So who are you? I mean, what 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 is the work that you do? What's your background, right? Um, I mean, we're we're talking today about something a little bit different, All right? Yeah. Right. So we're talking about your work. We're going to be talking about your work with Brass Basel Open more generally, have and that's okay. Have, yeah. you, have you all introduced me yet, or should I introduce myself? Yeah, introduce, yes, so introduce, introduce okay, yourself. Okay, yeah. right. So uh, I'm Farhan uh, Farhan Idris. So like I'm the co-founder and like co-convener of this like I call it a critical humanities forum in Singapore and it's called Brass Basa Open uh, we do lots of like a how do I put it uh, we do lots of discussions a lot of like film screenings a lot of like workshops a lot of very in, like innovative um, how do I put it programs to actually like you know get people together and talk about stuff that are you know in the humanities and people want to learn more um, the other thing is about like I think we leverage quite a bit on our kind of connections with uh, people in civil society, people in the arts, and I think that's why like you know the kind of base started from there. Uh, I mean, as uh, as for my gra- background, actually, like um, um, currently I'm a, sadly I'm a freelance freelance researcher and writer based in Singapore, mm-hmm. but um, I did my graduate studies um, in um, in in two countries, uh, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, in Netherlands and Belgium, you know, there's this sense about like how, um, I wouldn't say intellectualism, but like how uh, critical theory, critical theory or, you know, slightly leftist concepts are actually like um, discussed like throughout society. Mm-hmm. And also because like activism uh, in the Netherlands and Belgium, you know, they are quite more, in, quite more engaged and quite more like, you know, um, I think for me, like um, when I when I stepped into uh, these two countries, uh, it was I, it was amazing because a, you don't uh, political expression was something that's taken uh, that is taken for granted, mm. right? I mean in Singapore, but like for, I think it's uh, in Belgium and Netherlands, it, you know, it's a way of life. Mm. Uh, for the towns that I was living in, there always there will always be you know like um, socialist like student communities or like trade, you know, like some sort of like um, local chapters or trade unions. So yeah, did you ever sort of? sit in on any of these go attend this because i'm just i'm just thinking is that where you got the idea for brass brass I, not really but like how do i put it i think people uh when you have your you know your peers taking uh taking all these ideas mm-hmm. taking actually like putting putting stuff that is uh abstract into like the the kind of everyday life so you kind of get uh well like there's this uh there's this burning not say burning desire but uh you know like if i was to say, if i were to say like um um, a eh, one day how can I make it happen in Singapore? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay, other than that, so I was talking about like a eh, the kind of um, how natural like in how natural this uh discussing politics is. Mm-hmm. So actually, like Brass Basa Open, we kind of started with like discussing uh philosophical texts, so anthropological texts, and the reason why we had this name uh, Brass Basa Open is not because like a eh, not because we own any property in Brass Basa or something like that. It's just because like we first met in Brass Basa. Actually, we first met, you know, at the kind of like the basement of like S- SMU. So uh, from that uh, from that time, I think we uh, we grew on. We had lots of supporters. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, you know, being there for us. Um, mm. And I think Sean is also like a, I think that's the reason how I knew Sean as well. Yeah. So <laughs> I knew Sean from like uh, way back, kind of attending the sessions. And I think that's what kind of spurred on my interest because that was way back before like I was before I knew anything about like critical humanities or just generally knew about like how to conceive of activism in general. So, I mean, in the way that I kind of got into it through you and Brass Basa Open, how did you get into critical theory, right? 
Ah, uh, okay, right. So, uh, critical theory, as you know, it's a very leftist, uh, you know, orientation. Is okay. What what is critical philosophy. theory? Like, let's say, let's see if we can give it's like a definition. Hard. So, like, okay, so like critical theory has this element about like a um, talking about talking about social like philosophy in terms of, like so, uh, social phenomenon mm-hmm. that can give you a theory of like lib- like liberation or um, out of like oppression mm-hmm. and current like current discourses about you know like um, uh, maybe like you know gender oppression. Uh, like um, neoliberalism capitalism capitalism so uh, i think broadly that's a uh, that's critical theory for you and now like we do have a lot of like dimensions of critical theory you know like fem- feminist critical theory queer feminist queer like the critical theory marxist critical theory that, that's a lot of like you know like you can uh, it's, i would say it's uncountable but there are lots more kind of like uh, branches of critical theory like you can count uh, um, with your fingers okay so how did so how how and why did you get into it? Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Right. How how and why did I get get into it? Mm-hmm. Like basically, I think I did my. Is, is it too draggy? You know? Like I mean, I did my under undergraduate in uh in philosophy and and US, mm-hmm. and that's well, there was only one like one kind of like a seminar that I kind of like remember like not forgetting, uh, even up till now, and it was like on critical theory. Mm. Critical theory is actually not about logic. Uh. <laughs> it's not about critical thinking. It's really about like how do I put it? Putting um, giving like or thinking about like critiques about society so that you, know, you can you can talk about uh, liberation. You can talk about like um, uh, basically like stuff that undergirds society. You know, so uh, how society is formed, how society currently is like is shaped now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that takes a lot of like uh, a lot of elements, a lot of thinking as well. Yeah. But mm. I, how do I put it? I don't want to say that's the thing about like Brabha Open. Like um, the idea here is to bring like critical theory to you know people who are interested um, and um, in a way that is not uh, how do I put it? That is uh, how do I put it? That's, that do not that does not put off some people. Like some people might be kind of like fearful, but no, you know like the languages like the kind of uh, language like uh, you know philosophy or critical theory adopts. But I think we try to make it. Uh, we try to have discussions which are, uh, you know, like really. Uh, I mean, I can for me. I think I can like. Um, I can explain things very well. Uh, so uh, I think yeah. So. so. So what was it in that first critical theory module that you took that spoke to you so much? I. I mean, I. You know, I'm 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 in grad school now, and right, in, right, you know, okay. going through university. I think there are a lot of classes that have a sort of sociopolitical or critical bent, and then it kind of just. Either goes like whoop, you know, over their heads, or like they don't care, um, or or if or or worse still, it becomes like a fun kind of like playground for people to be like, right. oh, haha, like base and superstructure. Theory, you know, let the- me go and critique like the theory, like theory bros, yeah, yeah. theory bros, yeah. And then you know, just fighting pedantic. So what was it that made that really spoke to you? I think spoke to you on a level where you wanted to do something about it. Okay, so like uh, my uh, the kind of text that. Um, Got me into it. I think this um, by this like famous like critical theory pair is called uh, Adorno and Horkheimer. Mm. Uh, with their book, it's called the Dialectic of Enlightenment. So basically, in the book, it, uh, they state about you know how like um, uh, how with the progress of modernity, we actually in uh, in kind of human terms, we are actually deg- kind of regressing because hey, w- whatever we are doing in modernity, we are not really po- putting emphasis on how what it means to be human. Uh, um, how like uh, how can we you know like uh, as humans right like uh, uh, the political world the social world the economy is actually supposed to uh, to kind of like provide us uh, a, a kind of like certain element of like uh, element of like satisfaction uh, mm. in our lives why why is it not happening and why is it like uh, why is it sometimes like when talk about economy like you know it's some uh, we talk about economy as though that like the economy stands away from like human world, mm-hmm. uh, and I uh, I think their basic claim is just this. Basic ba- their basic claim is like um, a, the progress of modernity, right? Like it, it, I mean, eventually leads to you know like leads to stuff like world war and uh, stuff like et- ethnic cleansing, you know like. But again, um, I think that was kind of uh, the the foreground of it was to you know like um, a to make like. Uh, social existence, you know, like really, um, a, as in really foundational to a lot of thinking. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So you, yeah. So you went on then to do your MA, like you said, in two countries in Europe, right? Yeah. And then you came back to Singapore. Why? Why did you come back to Singapore? Uh, okay, obviously, like you know, the EU, right? Um, as as in, uh, they have a very like strict uh, policy on like um, on immigration, right? So even like when I finish school, like, you can you can't really. Uh, you can't really live there, um, because they, re- uh, they will revoke your. I think they will revoke your residence permit mm. after three months of, of graduation or something like that. Mm-hmm. Unless you're married to a EU person, lah. But like, you can't get jobs there anyway because mm. I can't speak Dutch. Oh. Uh, so like, I mean, getting back to Singapore is fine. But like, the thing is this: like, I think uh, when I had discussions with a lot of peers, they were telling me that you know, like, I need space for us to you know talk about all this. Uh, all this abstract, I wouldn't say abstract, but philosophical issues. But yet, we I've not really found a community to do that. Mm-hmm. And when I talk about like abstract philosophical issues, and talk about philosophical issues, it doesn't mean about like you know like wh- whether this table exists. That uh, that is like kind of like um, how do I put it? Uh, that's very trivial. No, like, we're talking about here. We are talking about um, okay. Uh, we are talking about stuff like uh, uh, what are the philosophical foundations of, for instance, uh, the universal basic income, uh. Like a, uh, what are the kind of a, uh, how how do you when you talk about like decolonization? How do you actually manage that intellectually? Like, is it sound to talk about decolonization without decolonizing uh, our kind of like practices, our you know our everyday selves, and um you know stuff like that. Uh, talk about actually even talking about like a uh, a uh, the kind of roles that a uh, that is assumed when we talk about like. Traditional, traditional, traditional culture versus like modern culture. Is it a, has it be a, has it is it a strict division uh, that kind of thing? Mm. So I I don't think it is. But yeah, um, we have kind of done a lot. Lo- I think a lot of discussions spanning a lot of a lot of topics. Mm. I think. Yeah. So that brings us to the founding of Brass Passa Open, right? It's basically mm-hmm. when you came back uh, from the EU and then, you know, you started this thing in the basement of SMU. Yeah, um, right. yeah so tell us more about your work with Brass Passa Open. It's been around for like, how many years now? Three, Just like three, four years? No, no, it's three years. Three, three years, years, right. Um, how has it kind of grown, you know? Okay, uh, I think firstly, right, you know, like uh, after I did all this like uh, graduate studies and all that, I came back to Singapore and like, just visited Malaysia. And you know how like how it kind of like uh, how there's a lot of variety of stuff that's happening in KL. Mm. And you know, like how I miss like you know how I think that you know like something like this should happen in Singapore. Mm. Uh, the stuff of the kind of things that happen like you know like connected to Gerak Budaya in KL. You know, there are a lot of like all this, uh, how do I put it, student organizations, activist societies, and also about like because uh, I mean, ex- uh, at that time, you know, like there's still uh, a lot of like a contested discussion surrounding like democracy. So, a lot of people are uh, very much, uh, I think, w- at that stage, uh, I think it, it was like uh, it was more accessible to a lot of peers. Mm-hmm. When compared to Singapore, it's like, hey, I really only need, I. R- Right now, I kind of like we started small. Um, uh, started small, you know, trying to kind of like a uh, getting my friends first, and then like so subsequently friends to friends, and then like because uh, I'm close with the people in civil society, I think they also knew about like uh, progressively they they knew about uh, Brabasa Open. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay, what was your other question again? Okay, so um, yeah, I I guess I want to I want to get into sort of what. Brass Passa Open does right. So I I think one of the mainstays of Brass Passa Open and, and one of the main um, things that Brass Passa Open opened with was just uh-huh. readings of critical social justice, socio politically oriented philosophical texts. Right. Yeah. So why I mean why did you choose these texts? Like why 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 does Brass Passa Open kind of have that 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 critical Bent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when we start, uh, when we first started Brass Basa Open, like uh, I was not alone. So like I have two co, like two co-founders, uh, Sean and Sean and Nazri. They can't be here today, and uh, because we already had this idea about like, hey, you know, wanting to do something like this, and when you talk about discussions, usually like what we try to do, it's uh, basically okay. We we uh, we do have an idea in mind. For instance, um, it's like it's for instance, it's translation a very neutral thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Just give you an example, and 
and we kind of divided our tasks. So like for instance, um, a, my my co partner like Nadri is a lit- literary scholar, so like he would kind of we would task him to do that to mm. have a discussion on that. And okay, uh, the other thing about like Brass Basa Open is this: uh, we are very very open to collaborating with a lot of like a a lot of like uh, how do I put it? Civil society organizations or I mean or uh, we know like gender. Um, gender-based uh, movements mm-hmm. like, I think we've done like um, other than like having discussions we've actually also done fundraisers for for instance like uh, I think I love it, loved it a lot like we've done fundraisers for Project X mm-hmm. we've done raises, fundraisers for the T project so um, and I think the reason why we kind of did this is because we also want to tell people that hey these are serious matters you know like talking about sex work talking about decriminalization of sex work it's not just something that people uh you know, like it's not just a slogan. Mm-hmm. A real life experiences, uh, real life experiences of people. Uh, we are discussing this. Uh, you know, from uh, uh, from why people uh, people want to actually you know do sex work, for instance. Mm-hmm. And the T project. Um, yeah. So like, a, when you know, when you talk about like a queer histories in Singapore or Southeast Asia, we tend to talk about you know like how these are kind of imported. A, you know LGBT like movements are imported from the West they are not because like we do have histories of you know like uh, queer movements and LGBT uh, histories here in Singapore uh, not in, not just in Singapore per se but like uh, in, in, in generally in Southeast Asia and we've not actually had like productive discussion on it mm-hmm. wanted to tell people that hey like these are part of our histories too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so I think I, I want to just sort of ask this question here which is you know I think some some people may see activism in terms of like getting on the ground and then like doing that kind of physical direct kind of work but you're doing readings discussions and then later we'll get into like the theory film sessions that you have so (laughs) i mean i just i want to kind of have your take on that what do you think this achieves what do you think it does for civil society or for our political situation in singapore Okay, this is my own perspective. Uh, it's not perspe- perspe- perspectives of like my co um, my co collaborators, but uh, for me, like I think the the reason why I'm continuing with this is because like I can we can sorry I can forge connections with like you know like there's this intersection between civil society, uh, between people at large who are you know like who want to do like who want to do a lot of like um, critical thinking uh, a, in a way that is uh, very uh, very comfortable with them mm-hmm. and um, and by doing so um, how do I put it a, yeah a, and uh, people might be you know people in uh, civil society might be interested people might, in the arts might be you know like confi- not say confident but you know like knowing that like a community like this exists like mm-hmm. you know you can take yeah, this take takeaways uh can be you know like translated into like si- um into uh into thinking into activism so um so i i do think we don't really do like direct into like activism but we do kind of indirect activism mm. and uh when we talk about brass basa open as a kind of space uh, to to talk about like a very critical issues um mm. very philosophical uh uh issues on a philosophical level for instance mm. um when when we uh when we kind of talk about it, um, okay, wait, I lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, 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 hey, wait, like, mm. uh, there's something that I want, wanted to say. Uh, um, I mean, you go to the events, when you talk about very philosophical issues. Uh, okay, how do I put it? So, uh, a lot of, like, our kind of, sometimes we actually uh, have discussions with, uh, you know, like, book authors who, uh, actually, they are very keen about talking about their like recent books uh, mm. and uh, these are people you know like from all over the world actually so mm-hmm. like they are academics they are uh, they are writers um, and okay so we call ourselves like as in there is a way in which like we don't call ourselves like an academic space as, at all mm-hmm. but we call ourselves a kind of like para-academic space which is a uh, kind of space that is away para uh, from academics uh, spaces but you know not into the kind of formal academic Formal academic spaces, which are actually quite sterile as well. Mm-hmm. So okay, so take me through kind of one of your sessions. What what happens? What typically happens? Okay, maybe like I will start with how I think uh, PJ was in. Was it what it was involved? I think PJ was like invited 
to one of this like uh, I think one of the um, one of the sessions I got organized uh, with um, people from the arts. So we did we did this thing even even before like eh, there's a there's a like I think was it this year about like uh, the Raffles monuments and stuff like that. No, no, it was last year. Was last, last year was yeah. the centenary. So, Okay, yeah. So like uh, before that, I think we have a uh, kind of I call it a town hall discussion mm-hmm. about what we call like the Raffles must fall um, uh, town hall. Raffles must fall is actually a kind of it's just a pun about like a thing a few years back there was this uh, roads uh, must fall. Yeah, there was yeah. this discussion in Oxford and like Cape Town about like a uh, how like colon like you know like colonial statues for instance. Uh, wh- why do we need why do we need this? And um, ultimately, the discussion uh, revolves around like what exactly is decolonization. A how like how are like minorities' lives uh, impacted uh, within it, and when you talk about you know like even when you talk about like memorialization, you know like there are certain kinds of politics that are implied within it. Okay, mm. for instance, like hey, like people, you know, there's this critic about like hey, we can't remove like statues because look, we uh we can't remove parts of history. But to be honest, like who the hell if you want to learn about history, right, you should hit the books. Um, yeah, <laughs> you don't like. You don't look at statues and say like, "Wow, I've learned about history." No. Yeah, no, no. Statues are not history; they're commemoration. Correct. Mm. Yeah. Right, and you choose who to commemorate. And commemoration, statue. commemoration is something that's contested all, all, like yeah. all throughout the years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the question was uh, yeah, so running so us through yeah. a session. So of yeah, what happens yeah. on a, in a typical brass bass <laughs> oh, okay. session? Um, there are actually no typical like brass bass open session. So mm. uh, as I said, we do about some workshops. We mm. do like. Uh, okay, some workshops are based on like uh, the interests of uh, personally our members, or our like our core team. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was this workshop we did. Uh, we did about like um, photography, uh, photography and uh, photography and like sh- uh, and vulnerability. Um, in well, it means to say that you know like how uh, how f- uh, the kind of production of photography. Um, how does it like you know how is it ethical in a way for instance like um you talk you talk about like pictures that are situated in like war-torn narratives you know like um is it uh is it ethical to kind of talk about that way like what our kind of like what exactly our when we are the audience of this particular photograph like how are we complicit into this like mm. this narrative of you know like uh this narrative or what they call it a uh, watching people suffer something like that mm-hmm. um and okay one of my favorite like I think one of my favorite events. We are gonna do it again, like after COVID, I guess. So one of my favorite events. Uh, this is something that I was thinking. Um, one day I was like, eh, I think during Chinese New Year or something. Like I was uh kind of like, eh, doing karaoke with my friends. Then like so for some reason like you know I discovered that hey like you know um, current like really current like pop songs um, doesn't there isn't any you know like, doesn't isn't any picks with. There aren't uh, any what? There isn't any picks like you know. Oh peaks. Picks. Uh, okay. Yeah, picks being say that like um. Songs that are emotionally emotive enough for you to actually, uh, express your emotions. Okay. There's a reason for it because, like, ultimately, I think pop, like, it's a uh, extension of how you know, like, how pol- like how the kind of how sociality works. Okay, for instance, right, like, a uh, currently, you know, there's this no um, I there's uh this team team about like a, uh, I think in indie music also there's this about there's this team um, having like music with no peaks. Okay. Right? Uh, and how do I put it? Uh, I think this idea is about like how you know like um, uh, you know like when you talk about expression, uh, uh when you talk about living in a new neoliberal society, right? Uh, we talk about like how people survive. Mm-hmm. And um, currently, like we like when people talk about survival, we talk about like currently, like when I mean my peers talk about work, you know, it's a, a very like ironic thing. Mm-hmm. Like uh, you know, I hate work, but every day I go to work. And they can't talk about edit anything other than work, so a lot of things is this about like you don't have like you can't express yourself at the workplace because uh, you know you're suffering or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's a very like um, uh, what I call a very non like it's the kind of songs that are no it's not there's a, isn't any pick at all. Yeah. But for instance, uh, you compare about like um, Sabde on the eighties, uh, you know, like emotional highs, uh, the kind of thing that you know you sing without any. You know, like any banisters or whatsoever, mm-hmm. um, and I realized something about like uh, you know this actually we can create it to be a kind of fun like karaoke, karaoke competition. Uh, mm-hmm. Like you know, like I think a few years, a few decades back, there was this thing called uh, Asia Bagus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we uh we get people got people from like the art scene, civil society, and like uh, our fellow like um our uh our fellow artists uh the uh the band Observatory. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, we did this uh, uh, competition uh, whereby people like uh, sing songs that they think express best a critique of new neoliberal uh, neoliberal society mm-hmm. or like neoliberal. I call it aesthetics in which like you can't express yourself. You uh you know the only way you relate to the to relate relate to the outside world is is the kind of like ar- irony you have. Mm. So these songs need to be need to be really something that is uh, away from it away from it and. A, okay, like uh, this is an A side, but like a lot of English songs are very, you know, English songs are very neutral, uh-huh. right? In what sense? As in, yeah, okay. So I- in what sense, like contrast it against? Yeah, you contrast it with a lot of like a, a lot of your songs in your mother tongues, a lot of songs in like a Hokkien, Lao, Malay, Indonesian, Chinese, which is like really strongly, you know, like strongly worded, strongly like mm-hmm. directly, uh, you know, directly uh, wanting to, you know, like. I mean, I'm thinking of like the the Ji Wang songs. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah exactly. Like, I I think that's that's what you're kind of referencing here. But and, okay, yeah. so like, uh, just wanted to conclude. Like, you know, a lot of this like cultural stuff that we do, actually have, you know, like, uh, we can we can actually think uh, a lot of things beyond like, eh, that's embedded between like you know in in our cultural practices like karaoke. Like karaoke is one of them. Hmm. So uh, we are gonna uh, we are gonna do it again. Uh, after that. Uh, Right now, like the next team we have is like devotional songs. Uh, I'm sorry, what devotional, devotional songs? songs? One like one example would be uh, that duet. I think Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. All right, the Prince of Egypt song. What's the name? Uh? You can uh, you can believe it. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, so I I'm I'm sort of noticing that like aesthetics mm. art right features yeah. a lot in the work that Brass Basa Open does. Is there a reason for like why that link? Okay, yeah. So like yeah. Uh, a lot of our, we, uh, how do I put it? We uh, we have collaborations with a lot of art spaces. Uh, for instance, uh, for instance, this uh, art space uh, in Geelong is called uh, Sawal Stats. We actually lo- do lots of collaborations with them and they provide us space in which like we can, uh, we do our like, I think our flagship uh, film discussions. Mm. And we mean by flagship is I think we are the longest uh, right now I think we are the longest current like film discussion like uh, mm, film discussion uh, group or fil- film discussion uh, ev- uh, event uh, in probably in Singapore right now. Mm. Uh, what we do in film like uh, they call it theory film sessions is we actually we pair a lot of these critical theory readings with how and a lot of like films and films we we uh, do not really like uh, we don't really actually like like mainstream films we wouldn't say we are we like uh, art house films lah but we try to stay away uh, films from films that are very much in our kind of like uh, in our popular aesthetics you know a lot of like this uh, East Asian you know like what call it uh, East Asian uh, Tui films uh, Wong Kawai is it the kind of, the kind of, uh, okay. We also like try to ov- uh, try to move away from like European French film noir, for instance, and mm. we try to a a um what's the what's the term for it? We try to curate uh, film theory events that uh that showcase a lot of like cinema from all across the world. Mm. We've done like films from Lebanon, lo- we've done films from like Guinea Bissau, uh, th- stuff like that. Mm. Um. So uh, it opens opens avenues for people to to see that a lot of like a lot of like, structural issues, uh, like if, uh, a lot of structural issues are actually you know like uh, are being dealt uh, uh, across the world. Okay, for instance, um, um, we did a film screening on this like particular Mauritanian uh, Mauritanian film director, the work of uh, called Abraham Sisoko, mm. and in the film it talks about basically about how Europe has um impoverished uh, impoverished like sub saharan africa mm-hmm. and the kind of like um a, what are the ramifications in our current system are the kind of like truth and recon- re- truth and reconciliation like movements are they actually doing the stuff that that they need like uh if for instance the international iwf is it what's iwf uh, like international world bank I don't know. IMF? IMF, 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 IMF. IMF. Okay. So like IMF has been giving all this like a, how do I put it, loans to sub sub Saharan like a countries with but uh, with a lot of like all this, you know, like a lot of this interest. Uh a, how do I, how how are these like 
how how are these actually affecting a lot of like a people uh, people on the ground in uh, this kind of countries and a lot of these filmmakers actually have like a kind of like uh, they know what's going on and, and they try to kind of tell us you know like this uh, uh these are issues that can also be represented in uh, on the screen mm-hmm. so ultimately i think um, there's a lot of appreciation about like stuff that mm-hmm. kind of like currently uh happening all across the world mm-hmm. yeah. so i, I want to sort of put some pressure on that which is okay so you're taking films that fall far outside of representation right? i mean i gotta admit when you said no wong kawaii no european stuff i was like what's left hmm. and then, you know, oh, i mean okay, okay, i right, mean right, right. you know because it's y- you know, you go to the projector or you go and look at art house films and it's always kind of one of the two, right? So so I, 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 I like the I love the idea of sort of taking these films that fall outside of conventional representation and then bringing them into the the, the not the mainstream, but bring them into this space where, you know, you can get people exposed to it. I just wanna ask sort of how do you bring theory into that and really what's the kind of political or critical goal here? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think basically we uh, the kind of critical or political goal is to tell people that hey, uh, you know all these genres that we have, they are how do I put, they are not just um, how do I put it? They are not just telling you that hey, you know this aesthetics happen and like mm-hmm. wow, this like film shots is amazing, mm-hmm. uh, you know like a to and then like we we don't want to develop a kind of like community of you know like film critics actually, mm-hmm. we wanted to de- develop a community that tries to read. Mm-hmm. tries to read films as as social text mm-hmm. uh and um okay uh while curating this uh, i'm not just the one who's creating this like my co co uh, co collaborators uh, do the same thing too mm-hmm. but we have already been exposed to a lot of kind of like um i think world cinema for instance and a lot of themes uh like um e- the other time we did uh, stuff on like nostalgia can I mean you can see how like uh, singapore is like famous for Having all this, all this like post-colonial uh, nostalgia, mm-hmm. uh, we've this uh, we've d- uh, done some mm, something on like the narration of on suicide of suicide in films, mm-hmm. a, how like people are motivated to uh, you know like a, to do all kinds of actions because they are you know they run out of options something mm-hmm. like that, uh, yeah so like um, keep keep in touch uh, how do I put it uh, with our Facebook page Facebook dot com slash Brass Basa Open mm. to find out more about like I think we'll be doing a lot of a lot more mm. events after after November okay wait uh, if uh, COVID COVID it dissipates uh, we'll do more public events but mm. right now I think we can only focus on like you know stuff uh, stuff we can do on Zoom mm-hmm. yeah I mean the Zoom events are great also and I, and I think that brings us to one of the events that you know has recently been coming out right which is Arts Basa so Oh okay. What's what's arts basa? <laughs> okay, um, like we called it. Uh, we have this like roundtable discussions. Uh, it's called arts arts basa for no particular reason, but mm. no particular reason because uh, a uh, uh, how do I put it? We couldn't think of a a good name. Basically, uh, we wanted to talk about the uh, the kind of situations in the arts where people are grappling with. For instance, about like how uh, you know minority representation in the arts. There's like at least for the past two years, you know, there'll be discourses around uh, you know representation around visibility. But how exactly uh, you know like how does how does it change things? For instance, uh, uh minorities uh, you know like are minorities actually leading the work? Mm-hmm. Did do they get support from like other people in the arts, mm-hmm. or are they like just treated like the kind of like cultural currency in which like in which institutions can say, hey, look, like we are. Uh, we are doing uh, like a lot of stuff, uh, you know, like social justice. But ultimately, I think like uh, ultimately, these are not um, the kind of um, cultural capital. Mm. They are not like uh, they have the cultural capital, but uh, at the uh, on the backs of like minorities. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So like um, yeah. So uh, that was the purpose of doing art basa sessions. We are gonna do it again, mm-hmm. or uh, like. Uh, on teams like that so uh, mm. stay tuned okay so I mean your work with Brass Basa Open isn't sort of exhaustive of the work that you do so you're doing a a thing with Singapore Writers Festival that's coming up quite soon so can you tell us about that I heard something about cookbooks and I was very intrigued okay as I think as you remember like uh, when I talk about Brass Basa Open we do a lot of this like uh, unconventional things uh, 
uh, talking about things which you know like uh, uh, intuitively how like how do you like connect things together mm. so like in Singapore uh, we've, uh, we've done like a lot of uh, at least for the past two years uh, we've uh, involved ourselves in uh, the Singapore Writers Festival uh, in terms of like work giving workshops in terms of um, in terms of like uh, uh, conducting uh, what do you call it interviews no not interviews like uh, panels panel mm. discussions so currently uh, in the next uh, Singapore Writers Festival will be held around two weeks from now mm. Uh, Blah Blah Open, we have uh, around like three uh, three programs, okay? Uh, the first one is uh, led by me. Uh, it's on, you call it like, I call it cookbooks as, as philosophical texts. Uh, um, intuition, uh, intuition, um, intuition and experience. So basically, you know, when we talk about cookbooks, uh, we talk about cookbooks as though it's like, it's a very passive thing, okay? You just copy, just copy, uh, copy some recipes without your own, you know, like, uh, without your own input, mm-hmm. why are people re- like when people read cookbooks in 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 the sense that like people uh you know like the imagination is this like um you derive imp- your imagination for the cookbook itself not from uh you know like not from your own like um perspective and uh there are al- also a lot of issues with regarding cookbooks and uh, cookbooks are not just cookbooks they sometimes they have the voice of the author mm-hmm. and they say something about like um how I got into like cooking and then um, they some of them will tell them will tell us that uh, I've been like when I lived in Europe like I've been alienated from my own culture and the uh, okay the concept of alienation is a very like philosophical concept so I've been uh, alienated from my own like culture and how do I how do I uh, come to grasp with like coming back to my own like to my own heritage is to mm. actually like you know um, to actually reassemble what I know from like you know from my grandparents mm. And what you know, the the thing that like usually we don't obviously we don't get like, uh, usually a lot of us you know we don't a- actually get physical possession of, from our grandparents you know we actually get a lot of intangible stuff, mm-hmm. right you know like stories a lot like recipes um so um, uh so that is why I what I meant by cookbooks are philosophical texts, and there's this idea that I think you know that you know like in French cuisine in like uh in a lot of European cuisine like this idea about um you know everything has to be to the hill uh follow the follow the recipes uh in uh in detail mm-hmm. although like in our current context you know like in asian cooking cu- southeast asian cooking especially you know like you call it like aga aga right like aga aga like uses a lot of intuition how do you develop how you how do you like develop a kind of sense of intuition and a sense of imagination okay that is our programming so um our prog- uh uh will help with the Cookbooks as philosophical texts uh, will be done over two sessions, mm. uh, so I'll be talking uh, talking you guys through it. Um, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the other two programs we have, uh, don't mind me. I'll read from some texts because, uh, okay. So uh, the other one is about like um, how um, how like uh, the Asian South Asian classics uh, classical texts, they are you know they are still like in our imagination mm-hmm. and. When we say our, in our imagination, means to say that also like a, a lot of these translations uh, into like cl- classical texts in Malay, uh, when it translates into English, uh, is readapted into other mediums. Um, I mean, like uh, I think we can uh, get. I, I know whether we can get examples, but um, and okay, examples. I'm uh, meaning to say that like you know all these folk tales when you translate it into mm-hmm, like theoretical mm-hmm. uh, terms or like a uh, t- uh, t- t- theatrical mm-hmm. productions um, and uh, yeah like how how is it that we can translate it into our own particular context um, mm. and yeah so uh, this is uh, this is one of our, uh, another of our program it's called Under Under Their Skins The Lives of Classics in Translation and Adaptation mm. the last program we have it's uh, very very unique uh, it's a panel discussion with, uh, with artists and it's called You Auto Complete Me uh, you Auto Complete Me is a lecture performance and workshop that aims to inculcate critical reading skills in its participants by exploring a lot of this like relations, in, we call it intimacies between like chatbots, mm. how you interact with chatbots mm. uh, and our everyday use of it. I, uh, I think you remember this, huh? like uh, when, you, when you go to like government government websites, there's this like chatbot in like mm. called Jamie, which is appears everywhere. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So it's that kind of like, uh, like when people, uh, you know, like when this like, 
when the this intermediary between your what you want from like uh, what you need from uh, from the website and suddenly it's in intermediated by a chatbot mm-hmm. so how does it make you feel like uh, can it be you know like can it be lampoon in a very like artistic manner for instance yeah okay so those are the three um the three programs we have uh, for singapore writers festival hmm. okay so um yeah so i i i find i find the whole series of 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 things and events very very fascinating right there's a very strong link right which i asked you about just now the strong link between aesthetics and politics right right so i i want to kind of get into that a little bit more right so you know yeah what, what what why why art why cookbooks why films right why that whole aesthetic medium I think uh it's simply because this are the kind of stuff that we do in our everyday life and when we kind of like assess this particular things mm-hmm. we don't really access it in a way that you know like it's very you know like strictly you know like um clearly say that um I have reasons blah 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 for it no Like we do like appreciate things because you know like there's as the aesthetic considerations, mm-hmm. uh, how you find things you know like beautiful, how you find it, how you find things good, mm-hmm. and uh, these are kind of like these are kind of intuition that you actually don't develop like alone. Mm-hmm. You develop in a si- develop this in a society whereby it can be, uh, it can be like veering towards it can be veering towards the kind of like if society is like, it's uh. Uh, it's uh, racially dominated, for instance. You, mm-hmm. and when r- racial domination just doesn't just stop at like uh, structural issues, they actually like permeate, permeate our own uh, how do I put it, a our own, our critical uh, understanding of uh, aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, um, a lot of like my friends say uh, Chinese friends. I'm so sorry, Chinese middle class friends. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't hate you, <laughs> but fine, like uh, they have to. They have this thinking about like, hey, I want to learn Malay because it's a simple language to learn. But oh, okay, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. But that's that and then like like they will point out that it's that there are a lot of words that are kind of similar to English, and that's what makes it simple. And not only that, like it comes to the kind of like realization about you know they have this uh, consideration that hey, actually Malay <laughs> is spoken by people who are. PJ is like melting down right now. <laughs> I'm just it's embarrassed on behalf. Yeah, of yeah, it's uh. So I've heard the, and and it's, and it's less complex lah because it's less complex because you know like a Malay culture is less complex. For instance, you know that this is discussed like a few, oh few months ago about like Pranakan. <laughs> 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 no, and they come to me and they say this because they think that I'm Malay. Oh right, I'm okay, like, okay. I can't help you out here. I'm not even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why would you just assume that I'm Malay? You know? So there's this like a high culture about like English language and look like and like uh you know like a. Um, like you know, minor cultures like Malay language. And that is mm-hmm. not true. So mm. that's mm. that's because like people do not do not think that there are a lot of, of things going on in uh, the Malay language, in Malay literature, mm-hmm. in Malay critical theory. Uh, and yeah, these are the kinds of things which you know, this kind of kind of, kind of things that is uh, Singaporeans actually implicitly a uh, hold within them, but they don't really know. So you're saying there's like a a connection between the realm of aesthetics, what we consume yeah. every day, like yeah. So yeah. okay, so just I want to sort of shed more light on this because this is a frustrating thing that's happened to me more than once. Where does this stupid idea that <laughs> Malay is a simple language less culture come from? Okay, look, I mean, like these are not stuff that you know is picked out of thin air. Like mm-hmm. I think PJ would know that a lot of this, like a a lot of this, like a how to put it. A, a lot of this historical aesthetic considerations it's much has also a lot to do with like a lot of like british representations of like malays uh in the colonial era and, and it, it passes down to post colonial leaders as you know mm-hmm. uh, do you have anything to say about that i have way <laughs> too much to say about that <laughs> but yeah i mean fundamentally during the colonial period the british uh had a policy of um segmenting and dividing the population into economic niches yep. um, and in order to justify that um, or perhaps in justification of, of that I mean it's um, there's a correlation it's and I'm sure it influenced them both ways but mm. they would then uh, talk about the the, the li- ethno-linguistic groups that occupied each of these niches in ways that justified why they would occupy that So the Chinese were, you know, industrious and hardworking, but also, you know, not necessarily trustworthy and 
um, the but they were willing to to work themselves to the bone and, and uh, but you had to monitor them closely. So uh, you know, and they were and they had a tendency towards uh, conspiracy and secret societies. So they occupied the, the you know the coolie merchant trader segment of the population, and so the stereotypes fit that right. Uh, and then, whereas the, uh, for the local Malay uh, indigenous population, the British had a policy of, well, we don't want to upset the local society and structure because we need our collaborators, the sultans, to have, um, you know, maintain their position in that society, maintain their power. So we want to keep Malays in agriculture and don't let them into industry, into trade, into the ports, um, into the port sector. So then they talk about Malays as well, you know, they like living on the farm, they like having the simple life, you know, they're so much more uh, artistic, family oriented, you know, and, and so it justifies them then being kept there. So there's this whole relationship between uh, actually, as you're saying, aesthetics, uh, culture and how we create, we think of culture um, and then your economic position in a society, which mm -hmm. is very very much manufactured by the British period uh, with the collaboration of course of local elites and Anglophile uh, elites by the way <laughs> sorry Anglophile elites Anglophile elites yes mm -hmm. um, and also of course international capital shaped uh, Singapore shaped Malaya very much uh, because we had Chinese capital we had Indian capital traders uh, all exerting and influencing and shaping society as well mm. So, so you know, there's a deep, intimate, long-standing relationship between colonialism, between uh, economics, on our culture and society. Because, of course, then these were adopted post-independence by almost wholeheartedly hmm. by the by P the PAP and, of course, by LKY, who then attributed these very essentialist characteristics to the different races. You know, and and these have continued to underpin how our government manages race since, hmm. um, even though of course they are ahistorical and not rooted in any uh, you know deep understanding of history um, or any understand you know genuine understanding of our culture, um, and and they're very much more about uh, the bureaucratization of race into. Uh, certain categories that allow for easy management and minimal um, sort of uh, minimal critical thinking about them but you know just make it easy to manage race yeah. okay so I actually want to add on for it. I think this is a very important point you know mm. like uh, when you talk about public intellectualism in Singapore mm. uh, basically like uh, just like intellectual work in Singapore you notice something right you notice some, like the discourse is uh, kind of like pushed through by a lot of like Chinese, Chinese middle class academics or authors mm. so Brother Asa Open will try to kind of like tell people that hey look you know like a, you know uh uh, it's not just minority representation. It's actually more, also more about how you know, like, uh, minorities can lead, like, a, can lead uh, discourses surrounding, critical discourses surrounding, like, uh, you know, like the abstract stuff, uh, the everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say something. Does this uh, previously does this uh, does this tendency about like how you know like um, the, we call it the theory and practice uh, distinction, like only like the the well-off, only white people, only like Chinese Anglophile people can talk about theory, where everyone else only talk about their own experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's that pra practice thing. Uh, and there's a, re like, a reason for it because like, um, well, you don't, you know, like, eh, there's un like, because uh, eh, uh, publicly a lot of, uh, you know, like, um, a lot of uh, eh, intellectual intellectuals in public, they are, because ultimately also, you know, about, a how uh, how academia is structured in a way that racially yeah. disproportionate. I mm -hmm. think I think what you Something were saying like that. that the intellectuals academia also replicates the yeah, current yeah. hierarchy mm -hmm. of power in current, Singapore current, yeah. because it's very much funded by it and influenced by it and a tool of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, whereas you know what what in a healthy society really academia should be uh, uh, critiquing power and resistance to power. And trying to, um, yeah, think in very different ways, but we don't get that. Yeah, but I'm not just thinking about academia here. I'm thinking about spaces that are 
outside you know like in the interstices of like academia mm-hmm. the art sensible society mm-hmm. uh, when you look at it you know like minority artists generally when they are engaged they are engaged about they are usually engaged by institutions talking about ah oh, what are the experiences of like being Malay in Singapore uh, and this discourse has been like being there for like 20 or 30 years I mean I don't come to PJ and say like how how does your work how does your work like you know um speak uh speak to the chinese experience in singapore no <laughs> doesn't yeah, no, no because the chinese is the default Correct. you know it's yeah. the normalized singapore yeah and somehow you or a, a malay or an indian is is a deviation from the normal and so you know you're expected to represent that mm-hmm. deviation mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah <sighs> yeah all right so I actually i just mm. from this whole i just want to make one comment on the simplistic mm. thing mm. because it's it's at a point that that needs making that javanese culture history every bit as sophisticated and in-depth and interesting as say roman history mm. right and this has had a lot of impact on the javanese uh, if you look at javanese culture from before the european conquest and colonization Um, you know, you see things like family structures, which are very similar to Western Europe's living standard, life expectancy on par with Western Europe. And all of that was destroyed through mm-hmm. the Dutch colonization, mm-hmm. which extracted millions, uh, I think something like, um, I can't remember now, 20 million guilders in, in 1900 money, mm-hmm. right? Which you can imagine must be billions today. Um, extracted from the Javanese economy by the Dutch and the utter destruction of that historical legacy. Mm-hmm. So a lot of why we think, you know, um, it's not simply just that we've been painted this picture that things were, uh, you know, that, that the mal- mal- quote-unquote Malay culture, which mm-hmm. isn't even a, a, a mono culture, right? Mm-hmm. Malay yeah, is just correct. so diverse I, I across the archipelago. I think it's a pan, pan-ethnic culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's also a deliberate product of destruction by the West, which is trying to uh, turn Southeast Asia into an exploitative, you know, capitalist, client region for international capital to exploit mm. and we have to be really aware of that you know the the way we think of um of ourselves uh, as participating in continued capitalist exploitation when we talk about these stereotypes or we think about indigenous culture in that way mm. you know and if it hadn't been for this the, you know horrible Dutch conquest uh, and the you know we should be really we should be studying the Javanese the way we study the Romans mm-hmm. right. we, you know there's just so much richness and historical legacy there and and just because it's in Javanese and it's in in Indonesia we disdain it I think. okay so like I, I want to like expand on like uh, PJ's point huh? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of our thinking about like societies uh, actually come from the cold, uh, uh, cold war. You know, like mm-hmm. cold war has this like dimensions about particular axes of civil- civilization, Western civilization, Anglo American civilization, Indian civilization, Chinese Chinese civilization. Where like so like when we talk about that, we talk about axes surrounding this thing. So like civilizations equal to thought processes equal to like equal to uh, you know uh, you know like formative formative text for instance but we don't mm-hmm. talk about even within us we actually don't talk about like Southeast Asia as a generative force that uh, you know like that produce like uh, that produces ideas produces a lot of like critical theory uh, thinking historically um, I mean we tend to forget uh, like uh, in the Sri Vijaya age I think around like 800 uh, stuff like that so Southeast Asia especially like the maritime Southeast Asia mm-hmm. we are actually embedded strongly with what we call the uh, what we call the Hindu Buddhist cosmopolis uh, that is focused around like these three languages Sanskrit, Tamil and Malay and uh, as you know like uh, I think in Buddhism what happens is scholars uh, they, uh, they, they w- would want to travel like Buddhist scholars in the region uh, um, they w- would want to travel uh, they would want to travel to this like particular university called Nalanda mm-hmm. historically Nalanda la, in modern day India and what happens is this like uh, um, what happens is this so Sumatra or the ends of the, the age of Sumatra 
the age of Sumatra becomes a kind of like transit hub in which like scholars mingle. Mm. When scholars mingle, what they do is actually, hey, to be honest, I think we can mingle here. Why not just form our own universities here? So uh, Sumatra was actually a Buddhist, uh, at that time, 800. So it was actually a, uh, yeah, it was actually a kind of like an active, uh, act, like active site of the Buddhist cosmopolis. When you talk, so when you talk about, you want to talk about Buddhist texts, here you are, you know. Mm. You know, talk about like Buddhist history. Here we are. So Southeast Asia is never intellectually separate from the Indian subcontinent. Although, like in Southeast Asia, we, I mean, there's history of forgetting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I want to sort of take it now into your general idea of a theory of change, right? So what I mean by that, I mean it's a very you know revolution, sort of a, revolution. yeah you know uh, so so you're obviously in the business of revolution, right? I think that's un, that's 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 not. You know, I'm, here I'm, for I'm, question, I'm, but I'm, it's a I'm, kind of cultural aesthetic. Okay, maybe cultural shift. Yeah, kind of a, that kind of a revolution. So I want to hear. So how do you think that it's going to happen, uh, and how it should happen? Okay, what I can think about this, like what I like, how I think it, uh, it might not happen. Mm-hmm. To put it this way, like how do I put it? Singaporeans are more and more educated, and a but education doesn't like how do I put it? Doesn't guarantee a lot of like social change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean. A, like we are pushed to like you know like stem discourse we are pushed to a lot of like discourse surrounding like I don't know coding or something like that a, education doesn't actually like give you critical resources um, I mean like a mainstream of education doesn't give you the kind of uh, tools for you to actually engage the world uh, in a way that you can you know like you can involve yourself in in changing it Mm-hmm. So basically, as as you know, like if education is mine, uh, it's if it is an expression of, you know, like of the uh, how do I put it, of uh, the uh, the economic privilege privilege of mm-hmm. uh, people in certain backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So you you expect that these things will replicate like over and over the years. And I think the cliche about like education, um, or at least mainstream education can educate people into being not racist. Mm-hmm. That is not <laughs> that is not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, so I, I think mm-hmm. I should also mention a few well a few months ago now we uh, had a podcast with Stefan Ohani, uh, who talked uh, very much about education, about meritocracy, and stressed that uh, it's about um, limiting access to resources. Right, the, right, the whole yeah. idea of meritocracy. And education, he you know he critiqued the the banking system of education, as I think it was Paulo Ferreira who first uh, articulated it, um, and you know and and its inadequacies for uh, preparing people to uh, you know meet many of the the challenges of our modern world. So uh, if you're listening, do check out our uh, podcast from several months ago, mm-hmm. Stefano Hani. But uh, you know I think uh, this is I mean education fascinating. Maybe we should have. Another podcast on it because there's just so much to talk yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, on, on that note of education, so you, I want to kind of pick up on something that you said there, right? Which is okay. We're getting more and more educated, and I think there's this idea that okay, with education comes a certain sense of, um, I guess, social political awareness. But the distinction that you make there is that you only get that social political awareness with the critical resources when those are made available uh, to you. I actually don't think it's about that. It's actually about like a basically, you know, humanities, like uh, studying the humanities means mm-hmm. to say, uh, like provides you with the kind of tools in which like you can, you know, like uh, I wouldn't say criticize society, but like um, a, a, um, give you the tools in which you can see how some things are not working mm-hmm. in society. Uh, and I mean, like there. To be honest, I mean there. This this whole discourse surrounding like, um, the you know like um, you need like I mean Singapore right? Uh, discussed in, a uh in higher forums about like you know humanities should be, uh should play secondary roles uh mm-hmm. compared to like business law or something like that, mm-hmm. and this is. That's that's the reason I think why we ha- we have Brass Basa open is to kind of re- reinvigorate like hum- uh, thought processes thinking in the humanities. Okay, mm-hmm. sorry, what was no, the question? No, but my main question was: Can you share with us what are some of these uh, critical resources? Like critical resources, actually, you know, like Brass Basa open, we actually do not operate. We uh, do not operate uh, with like we are not paid to do this. Uh, mm-hmm. 
we are like generally I think uh, a lot of like our our work is uh, our work is based on like the what a kind of lab- labor of love is it for us <laughs> to kind of uh, yeah. know that like a community of us uh, there is a there exists a community of us you know we can mm-hmm. come together in a very non confront non confront con- non confrontational manner mm-hmm. uh, and you know like if people will not be kind of afraid to uh, to discuss a lot of this like uh, a lot of these things with us. Um, Regarding like, actually to be honest, also I would like also to talk. You know, like in more about our open session, maybe you can talk about like foundational, critical theory texts in mm-hmm. uh, in they call it critical pedagogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this famous uh, famous work that has been translated across the world uh, by the uh, Brazilian like educate educational theorist. It's called he's called um, Paulo Freire, and he writes this book called uh, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh, you can uh, in pedagogy of the oppressed, uh, he talks about education education in a manner that no, it's not just as I said. This is the banking uh, the banking system of education uh, mm-hmm. that Stefano Harney said. It's also about like um, it's also about like a building solidarity across like across class acl- uh, across classes to think about you know like the kind of prob- social problems you have, mm-hmm. and uh, in a way also to kind of. Uh, Say that hey look like you know it not it's not just based on a particular country but it provides a kind of sense of uh, internationalism as well. Mm-hmm. So and a critical p- uh, pedagogy does that. Uh, um, kind of mainstream education doesn't really provide you that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I I want to kind of get into a little bit of like. And this is like really, I'm stealing PJ's question here. But how do you make this sustainable? <laughs> I want to talk about sustainability. Right, okay. um, yeah. So I mean, for yourself, you've you you're you're working. I know Nasri has a ton of you know full time appointments, um, and Sean as well. But um, yeah, how 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 do you make it sustainable? Because you do a lot of work. You know. Uh, no, I don't. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you 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 uh, you know you set up the sessions. You have to get the space and everything. How do you sort of yeah, how do you manage that? You know, because it's all unpaid labor. How does that work? Okay, uh, a lot of times also, like, uh, I do, like, I actually do read widely in the humanities. So there was, I think that if, for instance, if there are books or particular, like, concepts I want to discuss, mm. uh, like, I come to my team members and say that, hey, look, uh, let me do, do this particular, like, part, uh, particular, like, uh, discussion. Let me do this discussion of existentialism and decolonization, for instance. Mm-hmm. And so, like, when you are, you know, when you when you have an event, actually, you are forced to read stuff. I mean, for me, la, I mean, because uh, when I kind of, uh, when I introduce for certain events, I not only need, need to host it, I also need to give a critical background on why people are discussing it. And mm-hmm. this involves, this involves some kind of, like, I also need, uh, I uh, this involves, like, the my background knowledge as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of work. I'm kind of also... We are not doing this like I think I, I need more people involved and maybe like I probably need to retire as well because I think social energy wise mm-hmm. has been quite terrible, especially with like COVID as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, um uh, is is that I mean that's the difficulty, right, with with keeping it going. But you've I mean the team has done a, a very great job so far, so I was just I was a bit saddened to hear that, that you know it's like oh, okay you know the social energy is being sucked out and the you know I think but it's fine because it's not it, it's not just me alone it's uh, my team so I mm-hmm. think my uh, my team is uh, very how do I put it they are generally um, they are, they are generally keen in talking about you know like current trends in uh, mm-hmm. current like. Uh, trends in anthropology, mm-hmm. current trends in literature, current trends in like cultural mm-hmm. studies. So, uh, even without me, like, even without you know, like, uh, yeah, even without me, like, you know, I think we can still draft a lot of people to conceptualize new, uh, new events, new ideas for people to discuss. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I have actually I have no problems in it because like, I I think we've done enough to actually have a critical audience that no- knows that you know like having a. A having developing tools in uh, in the humanities and be- developing tools in critical humanities is mm. is fundamental as well. So you feel like the space is going to continue even if you kind of step. Yeah, it is. Down. It is okay. definitely. All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, sort of the last question from me, I guess it's a it's a carryover question from many many weeks ago when we interviewed Loon, right? Um, 
And I think the idea there is that, you know, some people have this idea that theory or the critical humanities is like really highbrow and it's, and it's really inaccessible, you know. And, and then there's that slogan, you know, if your theory is not accessible, then it's not really praxis because only the, only the academy is going to read it, right? And it's not going to change anything. It's not going to spark or incite any new movements or currents of thought. So I guess I kind of wonder how do you kind of negotiate the two, right? Because you're talking about concepts like, you know, negative dialectics and... Uh, I've not <laughs> talked about that yet. Oh, so dialectics are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but, you know, these are, you know, they, 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 they're, not only, they're not to say, oh, super difficult concepts in themselves, right, but they're yeah. concepts that are born out of like such a huge history, right? That spans back you know, this, it's giant discussion from philosopher responding to philosopher responding to philosopher and you need that whole context in order to kind of <laughs> get into it, yeah. right? So there's a big barrier to entry. So yeah, how do you sort of negotiate that? Okay, I wouldn't say that it's a, a big barrier to entry but you need to notice also like we also kind of when our programs are uh, how do I put it? They they tend to a lot like uh, involve a lot of like people who are re- already like uh, educated in the liberal arts mm-hmm. or are like interested in liberal arts. So uh, we do attract that audience, but we must remember that like a lot of social stuff that uh, we are currently facing, in terms of you know like in terms of our everyday world, in terms of civil society, these are actually very very complex issues. Mm-hmm. Even when you talk about like stuff about like minimum wage, we want to talk about stuff about the death penalty. Mm-hmm. They are kind of like they are they are complex issues that cannot be just discussed within like uh, within um a within narratives or within um uh within expressions that are that are very basic mm-hmm. you know like when uh, when discourse takes uh, complex forms you also need to develop the kind of develop a kind of vocabulary that responds responds to this particular a uh, this particular set of com- uh, circumstances mm-hmm. and the humanities provides us stuff like this it, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that like you know like some people do not use this as, in a way to uh, it doesn't mean that like some people use a lot of like this very obscure, obscure, what's the word, Ob- obs- obscure. Yeah, obscure stuff to actually mm-hmm. kind of um, separate themselves from you know like the outside world. But mm-hmm. I believe that a uh, complex issues require like complex thinking, require mm-hmm. complex vocabularies, mm-hmm. and I think we shouldn't shy away from it. At the same time, also like this, uh, these vocabularies, vocabularies can be. Uh, can be uh, expressed to our full understanding. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we I mean like a few years ago we would not even talk about like um, intersectionality as a concept in social justice. Mm-hmm. But right now, you know, a lot of our youth uh, are using it, mm-hmm. are using it uh, in uh, in ways that like we know that they are using it correctly, mm-hmm. or yeah, they are using it in ways that like um, ways that Kimberly Crenshaw, the founder, like the. Uh, someone that's um, the uh, black thinker that has uh, coined this term mm-hmm. uh, they are using it do, uh, in a ways that has been you know used correctly so activism the youth mm-hmm. you know the youth like not me like I'm old mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the youth like you know like people from 80s 18 to 25 mm-hmm. actually even before they already know that kind of vocabulary vocabulary so like it's very mm-hmm. heartwarming mm-hmm. and these are the people who you know who you know that will come into activism sooner or later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's 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 an almost kind of like personal question for me because it's an issue that I'm struggling with, you know, especially even with Wake Up Singapore, right? Like back in the day, we would make memes about, ah, GST is going up, haha, <laughs> boo to the baby kind of thing, you know? And it's very like straight to the point. Yeah. And it rouses kind of, it rouses people's emotions, right? We had that like, Oh, you know, the, the PAP, like they give you a chicken wing and then they take the whole chicken, you know, like that kind of stuff. And it rouses people, it gets the views, it gets the clicks. But, and then now when we try and talk about things like, you know, regressive tax, the tax system in general, capitalism, then we get accused of being like, okay, you're like highbrow. Like being the, political, you know, politicizing. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, it's politicizing and it's just, oh, you know, this high theory and, and all that. So, I can't win here. I need right, I need yeah. answers. <laughs> you know, like like one option. You know, okay, I'm just pandering. And the other option, you know, it's it's way too way too highbrow. It's way too inaccessible. It's you know theory fluff. So, no. Historically speaking, <clears throat> a lot of these ideas do start out. Um, you know, a lot of ideas that we take today as common cu- currency start out as highbrow, yep. mm-hmm. and it it just takes time. We just need to explain them again and again. Mm-hmm. 
uh, but also demonstrate their relevance to our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think the best example is how we think of the economy mm -hmm. because these ideas start out as very highbrow, mm -hmm. right? What is the whole concept of an economy actually mm -hmm. only really came into existence around 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and for people to conceptualize this idea that there is this broader working of transactions between people that then adds up to this abstract number you know or concept that and that you can then say oh the economy is improving on mm -hmm. you know for it was very very alien mm -hmm. right but today it's like the air we breathe or, you know the economy is doing well you know mm -hmm. everyone knows that right and then the concepts embedded within that of capitalism right of tax you know of redistribution these all also started out very highbrow ideas mm -hmm. right and the idea that you know, you have to remember all of this, a lot of what we exist in today is just like the, the, the ideas are really, really recent in terms of human history. Mm -hmm. The idea that we have these systems where uh, you tax and then you redistribute and you take care of society in that way. Again, very, very, um, you know, uh, uh, even like 100 or just over 100 years ago, a lot of people still existed in this idea of feudal monarchy mm -hmm. and the tax is something you give to your local you know lord who in 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 exchange protects you but they have all these you know the idea of rights for example mm -hmm. you know that is post war right mm -hmm. fundamental the, the universal declaration of human rights so again i i mean i i know it doesn't really help us because we want lives to be better now mm. but speaking as historian you just got to wait and you keep making this argument patiently mm -hmm. and eventually it becomes a lot more current cur currency. And I think if, if I, if you give me a minute, I probably can think about something which was, mm -hmm. um, no, but that's, uh, that's a you know, great answer. I'm, 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 I'm stealing that because that's yeah. kind of like gives but me the, the, the theoretical, my, my answer, uh -huh. his answer. Probably I mean, both, answer. both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, l let me add on, uh -huh. add on here. Like there's also this, what I call the weaponization of his, the history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. So as you know, like the discourse surrounding like, uh, how do I put it? Like a unitary cult Chinese culture or like Chinese heritage <laughs> like, <laughs> it comes like in the 80s like, it comes in the 90s there's a reason for it like people uh, at, at least uh, a people in uh, in power they actually like you know um, how do I put it weaponize a lot of this like historical Chinese uh, philosophies mm. as mm. to kind of uh, as to provide foundations of what they what they think is like yeah. you know like uh, how we should govern society I mean uh, as you said like I mean there are a lot of this like Confucianists Mm -hmm. uh, in our midst mm -hmm. and stuff like that so like um, yeah stuff like that also can be uh, weaponized as well but uh, also we need to know that critical theory and philosophy is not a modern concept uh, and it's not just a kind of like a, the uh, the mainstream western philosophy that we, we normally encounter is not a, it has to be decol like it has to be de decolonized as in like if you talk about philo philosophy as a kind of like discuss um, the kind of like critical thinking, the kind of like rationality, mm -hmm. you need to realize also like you think think about uh you mean to say we think about uh philosophy as an in a kind of like normative manner, mm -hmm. normative meaning to say that hey, uh you know like a you do you do philosophy means you do critical theory critical theory means uh that's something we should aspire to, mm -hmm. but okay I want wanted to uh tell you that you know like this cannot be just you know like limited to west uh Western thought you know like. Historically, we do have like Indian thought, Chinese philosophy, Japanese philosophy, and these are not really like stuff that uh you know like talked upon through. Although like you know the current current impact or the current um mm -hmm. the current concepts in Indian philosophy just like you, you know like just uh when you it hits you, you you, uh, you you just like to be honest, it just uh when it hits you, right, you find out that stuff that was discussed like two thousand years ago are relevant now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in I think in Indian philosophy uh. You know, like uh, philosophers, like for instance, uh, Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna talked about this like uh, concepts called concept uh, called emptiness. Emptiness, something like uh, emptiness uh, in a way that you know, like whatever we, uh, whatever we, uh, the kind of uh, the kind of properties of stuff, they are not actually innate within itself, but it's actually construed. It's actually created by like other processes. In similar ways, right? Like we can see society. Society is not just. It's not just. Uh, a soul entity is actually the way in which like histor historically society politics and economics uh economics reacts in and you can't 
pinpoint a certain way in which uh, pinpoint a certain way in which uh, certain things like are the uh, a, are the direct cause of like a, our current like political uh, political juncture. So mm. uh, okay, you can read up more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like um, my uh, my favorite thing to do is actually to compare. Uh, I mean, comparative philosophy is to to compare. Mm-hmm. A either like Indian philosophers with like contemporary uh, contemporary post postmodern thinkers, mm-hmm. right? So like, uh, if ever you wanna kind of you can uh, talk to me about this, uh, feel free. Mm-hmm. And remember that like, um, yeah, ideas are not just ideas, but they are historical. I wouldn't say they're historical artifacts, lah. But uh, generally, I think also we have to realize that um, we are not special. Mm-hmm. Like we have like you know when we talk about stuff, right? We are kind of just uh you know we they are we are following or we are acknowledging the work of like i call it like what do you call it we are standing on the footsteps of on the shoulders, on of, the shoulders giants. of giants yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think it's i mean it's a human failing that we think that uh, the way things are today was both how it always has been and how it always will be mm-hmm. um, for some reason our minds work like that i'm sure there's a psychological explanation for it mm. but this is something which as a historian, I find very exhausting to push back against. But, you know, people always say, well, you know, society is like X like or Y. That, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, well, no, it was drastically different just 50 years ago. Two mm. generations ago, we acted, lived, thought in very different ways. And we have changed a lot, you know. And in order to understand our history, you need to understand that our perspective has so fundamentally shifted because of the events that have happened since. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then in 50 years, mm-hmm. all of this may not exist again. We, our grandchildren will be thinking in very different ways. The kind of things that we have today, the borders of Singapore, you know, the things we take for granted, all may not exist, mm-hmm. right? So there are, you, you can't just act on the assumption that nothing's going to I change. I hope that in 50 years, uh, the, the concept of Chinese privilege is not contested anymore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can't, can't wait for that day. But yeah. I mean, okay. Really, really last question. I know I keep saying last question, but really last question here. Now, you're tackling a lot of issues. Uh, Brass Pass Open tackles a lot of issues that are sort of cultural, ideological, right? And I would even say quite polemic. Like you're talking about sex workers' rights. Like you're talking about things that I think in, in, in the proper Singaporean academic discourse, we don't talk about. We don't talk about Chinese privilege. We don't talk about sex workers. We don't talk about trans people, right? And... So you're kind of talking about that, but is there ever a sense in which that culture of fear or, or the silencing of the government ever kind of creeps into the space or creeps into the way that you decide what should and shouldn't be discussed? Okay, I mean, to be honest, uh, I think we, we sometimes take that into account as well. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's why, like, uh, for instance, you know, when uh, the, I've been, the hard discourses surrounding, like, uh, the death penalty, for mm-hmm. instance, like, I mean, I would want to have, have actually a discussion uh, kind of like, how we have discussed this in the humanities, beyond just talking about like is this, you know, like is death a uh, is death penalty? How do I put it? Uh, uh, you know, like you conjure up statistics and kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So like you want to find out, you know, the moral like moral injustice of of something like this. Mm-hmm. But again, like I think we uh we don't do it like when the kind of like when the heat or intensity of the discourse is here. Mm-hmm. Like I think like this kind of things we also need to also need to take a, wouldn't say take a step back la, but I think it's for our own at least for me mm-hmm. um, I think we I don't don't want to unlike don't want to be unlike a kind of uh, answering lots of questions by you know like uh, by people who are not who are not understanding of what we do mm-hmm. so uh, progressively I think uh, I, I think yeah we do actually we discuss stuff like this very very indirectly mm-hmm. yeah Okay. I uh, think also, you know, I- I- if I can add something, Sean, the... Mm. Unfortunately, okay. the It's not just the fear, right? The fear is real. Mm. But it's not... The fear is not the main thing. It's how the contours of our conversations yeah. end up getting shaped by government assumptions. And one of the most insidious is the very transactional way we look at a lot of things. The cost-benefit analysis, mm. right? Rather than a moral perspective, what is right, what is wrong, who are we as a people? Instead, it's, well, what is the cost of it? You know, and what is the cost of doing something different? And then we compare the costs. Mm-hmm. And that is a very dangerous way to govern our lives mm-hmm. for obvious yep. reasons, right? Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, 
it's it's far cheaper to destroy the environment than it is to preserve it mm-hmm. right and so uh that rationally just destroy the environment but in the long term that's going to destroy all of our uh you know civilization human human humanity as a whole mm-hmm. uh things like that right um and then also the kind of assumptions the way that the government controls information it can shape the debate it can withhold it frequently very often withholds information so we're forced to talk about things in which we don't understand or don't have the data or don't know what's going on yeah. and and that is way more insidious than the fear i'd say mm. yeah Okay, so um, I want to thank you so much for coming down. Uh, Farhan from Bus Bus Open. You can find them on Facebook at... Facebook.com slash Bus Bus Open. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is like, uh, we, are, we don't have an Instagram presence, so, so sorry because I, I don't use Instagram. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then uh, keep a lookout for the SWF, SWF pro- like programming. SWF programming. Um, yeah. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I think like the, the current like, uh, the current SWF event should be right, should be out next week, mm. and also there are like this time around SWF right. There are a lot of really like good authors, good speakers. Uh, you call it, um, we call it the A list of like speakers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, cool, right. awesome. So thank you very much for joining us today, Farhan, and you know I really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. And uh, as always, thanks, Sean, for co-hosting. Very good questions. Thank um, you. I feel like I didn't have much to do today. You know, <laughs> it was really good just listening to you talk and uh, mm. the, the kind of insights that you had and the questions you were able to ask. You know, I was just, yeah. I enjoyed being a guest on, on uh, uh, an observer on my own <laughs> podcast for a change. It was great. Uh, it, and, it, and it was a change, is it? Usually you drive the conversation. Or well, no, no, I mean, usually it's, like it's, usually it's back more and balanced. Forth, back yeah, and yeah. Forth. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but okay. today I was just learning so much mm-hmm. that uh, I didn't want to interrupt or so, you know, because I was just like, this is fascinating. I want to listen. Um, but yeah, and, and then, of course, thank you to our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Uh, as always, uh, if you uh, enjoy what uh, we're doing here at New Narrative, please do join us at newnarrative.com slash join to check out our new website. Uh, or you can donate at newnarrative.com slash donate and check out our sister podcast, Southeast Asia Dispatches, uh, for more news interviews and commentary from around Southeast Asia. Thank you very much and see you next time.